all right so hollywood has shut down so is bollywood nollywood entertainment ultimately across the board here at home as well has ground to a halt but the one thing i've noticed is we remain entertained what do you say to americans who are watching you right now who are scared uh, i say that you're a terrible reporter that's what i say and i think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the american people the american people are looking for answers and they're looking for hope and you're doing sensationalism and you want to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism let's see if it works it might and it might not i happen to feel good about it but who knows i've been right a lot i watch donald trump every evening i find myself laughing he is the comic relief that i look forward to every day amidst the stress and the panic and anxiety around the coronavirus that remains with this country and the globe i watch trump because trump is unraveling today i'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the world health organization while a review is conducted to assess the world health organization's role in severely mismanaging and covering up the spread of the coronavirus. Everybody knows what's going on there. Trump doesn't know whether he's coming or going. Trump backtracks every day. And Trump is still insisting on trying to open up America's economy in the midst of a virus, in the midst of thousands of deaths. But Trump is like he's just a bizarre man to observe and he lies unprovoked every day so i'm watching this man every day and i am canning myself for a few hours and almost pretending i've forgotten about the challenges that face the rest of us but the other thing i noticed is south africans don't ever want to be left behind do you no because our celebrities have not entered the fray what am I talking about? You know the Department of Basic Education's initiative to start like a reading club where you've got celebrities reading to different groupings. So your celebrities reading to grade R learners. I understand some were teaching grade 11 English as well. It was really a hot mess, a hot, hot mess. And then an adjective are words that are used to describe or modify nouns or pronouns. Okay, so if I'm going to say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, Okay, so we would say I'm sitting quickly and that'll be my adjective because it's describing the noun. What? So you've got someone like Mohale Mutawum, uh, a celebrity, a reality show star, the husband of Somizim Khlongo, who's also a much loved character in the South African entertainment industry. So Mohale attempts to teach kids about adjectives. Then he goes on to give an example to illustrate what an adjective is but this example has no adjective i find that slightly problematic because these subjects matter too but the understanding or the messaging that's been communicated by the department that you don't need to be an expert to help with literature with english this is not the same attitude or approach when it comes to STEM subjects. The BA degrees or, or, or as you call them the bugger rolls are where we are having issues and Mahali was not the only one by the way. You also have DJ Spoo with his jazz hands all over the place and then you also have Pel Mudiadi who and if I understand really well was reading to grade R learners and then she uses words like illustrate. How sway? <laughs> And another thing that I think is actually wasting our time is this issue of alcohol and cigarettes, guys. The Gauteng Liquor Forum coming out of nowhere and threatening government and saying to the president they'll take him to the constitutional court if he doesn't amend regulations and allow for the sale of alcohol is unfair. I get that you're thirsty. I get that you miss your cigarettes. I get that you feel you weren't given enough time to stock up to prepare for the lockdown. But we have bigger issues coming. We've had scientists and experts saying to us, an avalanche is here for the country but once we end the lockdown because about 55 million people odd are vulnerable to this virus remember this is a completely new virus no one in the world has encountered this virus before we have no vaccine we have no treatment we have no immunity so that means we all at risk doesn't matter whether you're white black young old it doesn't matter you're at risk because you have no protective immunity. And that's why, as soon as the opportunity arises for this virus to spread, we are likely to see the 
exponential curve again. I don't know about you, but this week I managed to catch Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Uh, he had a media briefing alongside Health Minister Dr. Zoilim Kize. It really, really was a necessary masterclass in understanding COVID-19 as it manifests itself in our country. He was clear. He was reassuring. He helped us understand how we got to where we are. But he also made us understand why the lockdown was important and helped us understand that the lockdown doesn't stop Corona. Uh-uh. It doesn't halt now because we've had a lockdown that was that has since been extended. No, no, no. He has made us understand that the lockdown was to buy time. An avalanche is still headed away. A storm is coming our way. That's why the makeshift hospitals are so important. The additional beds, additional ventilators, the preparations of additional space in mortuaries. I don't know if you caught that, but they're speaking about that too. The idea is to try and slow it down so we don't have so many people dying. We already have well over 30 people who've died from COVID-19 in South Africa. The worst is headed our way. So we can't ever leave the story. And that's kind of what we're talking about. And as I said, the professor was incredibly clear. So I have to tell you that as much as we have succeeded in stemming the flow of this virus in our communities and keeping community transmission at a reasonably low level, and that is a success that no one else has achieved, I have to tell you a difficult truth. Can South Africa escape the worst of this epidemic? Is the exponential spread avoidable? The answer, sadly, is that that's very, very unlikely. Put simply, no. We cannot escape this epidemic. As I said, the professor was incredibly reassuring, but he was also very clear about what we're facing. And that's kind of what we are focusing on in today's episode of One More Thing, a podcast with myself, T.D. Lee, my dear. This is our fifth episode. I'm still doing this podcast from my closet at home. I am still speaking to people in a virtual sense. So in this week's episode, we'll speak to DA Interim Leader John Stianazen. He is sharing his views on what can be done differently to make sure that we get through this period. The DA is one of those that have come forward with an alternative uh, lockdown system. I think it's called a smart lockdown. John will share his views on how this is expected to work. John, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Chidi, thanks. Uh, Great to be with you and thanks for the opportunity. Please explain what a smart lockdown actually is and how it works. Well, what a smart lockdown is designed to do is to be able to transition your economy out of the hard lockdown. So the the strategy to go into a hard lockdown early uh, was the right decision to make. And the extension of the lockdown was also the right decision to make uh, because we don't have data. But a hard lockdown... Uh, is not a sustainable strategy over time uh, because you can't keep an economy locked down for the 18 to 24 months that most experts agree uh, COVID-19 is going to be with us. So you need to find some way of opening up sectors of your economy uh, to keep your your economy moving and to make sure that people's lives and livelihoods are protected during this time. Uh, There's no use defeating the virus and then ending up in a full-blown economic depression where you have large numbers of citizens who die from starvation, malnutrition, or from exposure. So the economic response is also very important. So what a smart lockdown does is allows you to move to different stages, depending on what the data is telling you. And of course, the underpinning of this whole smart lockdown model is the reliance on data. We have to be testing between 17,000 and 30,000 people per day so that you have a data set that helps you build a model on when you can expand and where you may necessarily later in the year need to contract back into a hard lockdown. But what it does is gives you the flexibility uh, to adapt to changing circumstances, and it also gives people an incentive to comply uh, more strictly with the regulations. Has the DA not jumped the gun? I mean, the government has not indicated in any way that we'll have a protracted hard lockdown. Are you not being impatient with the government in terms of already proposing what the next step should be? No, not at all. And I think that the modeling that we've done and the working paper that we've presented fits in perfectly and is complemented by uh, what uh, Professor Karim uh, sent and shared with the nation. Uh, what what we haven't seen from government is their plans on what would be their tra- what, what would underpin them transitioning uh, out of a hard lockdown. I want to reinforce that this is not 
a alternative plan. It's a plan that complements what governments are already doing. It accepts that governments made the right choices with the hard lockdown, uh, but that we need to be uh, looking at ways to move our economy and our people out of the hard lockdown phase in a safe way uh, that protects lives and livelihoods. So not jumping the gun at all. I think it's what an opposition party should be doing in a time of crisis is standing with the government, but also uh, not just simply abandoning and all critical faculties and marshalling those towards the national effort to beat COVID. And that's certainly what the, the spirit in which this plan is made and the spirit in which we've uh, presented it to President Ramaphosa. Uh, what we must not do is waste these five weeks. We must use them properly. I also think we need to dismiss this binary narrative that it's lives or livelihoods. It's got to be both. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it's the economic activity of, uh, of South Africans, working South Africans, that underpins the healthcare response in this. The doctors, the nurses, the hospitals, the ventilators are all paid out of the public purse. That public purse is sustained by taxes that citizens pay from economic activity. Remember, there's a twin threat to South African lives in South Africa. One is the spread of the virus and infection, and the other is a grinding economic recession. And you could actually, if we go into a full-blown depression, uh, see more people dying of starvation and hunger than actually would have submitted to the virus. So it is necessary, but yeah. it's not feasible in South Africa, precisely because you've got large sections of the population where we have, due to the skewed socioeconomic system that still exists in South Africa and the inequality that still exists of people living in township areas and informal settlements. It is impossible to self-quarantine or self-isolate in a two-bedroom shack where you're sharing with six people or a small RDP house where you've got an extended family. So that's precisely why the smart lockdown model makes so much more sense because in the South African context, uh, it is impossible for many of those people to self-isolate. Uh, self and we can't afford the hard lockdown over extended period. And that's why we must be able to have the flexibility to move between different stages, taking into account the unique South African context. Just to also understand the work behind the model very quickly. I know that the DA has its own team of experts. And I think earlier you spoke about how they're seeing the same things as what our Minister of Health and his team, led by Professor Karima seeing. Uh, are we not maybe just overloading the system with too many experts? We do have world-class experts by government leading the pack. Um, is it necessary that we have so many others being put up by different parties even to look into the same issue? I think that we've got to have uh, the best heads in the country looking at this issue from different angles. And I more think they are, yeah. And the more angles that you look at it, um, the better I think that the decision-making is going to be. And the, the closer we're going to come to finding the right solution for South Africa. So I don't think this is overloading. And, you know, I think that the notion that as an opposition party uh, at this time of our nation's crisis, we, we should be sitting in a corner keep, keeping quiet and not saying anything and sitting on our hands. Uh, that's not what, uh, what we were elected to do. And it certainly is members of parliament, not what our role and responsibility is in terms of the constitution. It's supposed to be providing a forum for national debate, and we are doing that. So I, you know, I reject mm. the criticism that, that we should just you know, keep quiet until this crisis is over. Quite the opposite. I think that as an opposition sure. party, we should be playing a role in putting ideas on the table and getting people and government thinking about, uh, about some of the issues. And we're going to continue to do it. Uh, people can criticize as much as they like. At the end of this crisis, I want to be able to look back and say that the DA gave South Africa of its best during its time of greatest need. Mm. John, just to also look at the DA itself, I remember the both the policy and uh, Congress, the elective Congress were being moved, uh, moved back towards, I think, September, October. It looks like the virus is going to be with us for a long while still, the elective conference rather. Um, what, are the, what, are, what are the thinking, what's the thinking within the party about navigating that space? I, I think that, um, you know, South Africa is going to fundamentally change over the course of the last period. And you'll notice even from our smart lockdown model, what we term in the, as the green, um, you know, the stage uh, one, which is what we regard yes, as yes, open, yes. even that has you know, it's not saying South Africa goes back to normal. It means that big public gatherings need to be limited, that mask wearing needs to become a, a function, social distancing must remain, self-isolation of the vulnerable sections of the population have to remain. 
and uh, PPE is going to be absolutely required everywhere. So I think the notion of getting 2,500 people into a venue in November uh, to have an elective conference is very optimistic. And, um, is, you know, if, uh, if you look at the modeling and the, the, uh, the thinking of Professor Kareem, it absolutely underpins ours that this is going to be something that's with us for another year, two years, and that a hard lockdown so, you know, may slow the curve. It's not going to stop it. So we need to look, I think, some innovative ways. Um, the federal executive and the National Management Committee are going to be engaging uh, over the next week or two about how we move forward in terms of the policy conference and the elective conference. Uh, there's various other models that are used in countries. In Britain, they elect their party leader via a postal vote. Uh, see how we can use technology, decentralizing voting perhaps at uh, various uh, provincial centers where people can come in uh, in smaller numbers uh, with social distancing to cast a vote uh, in front of scrutineers. But I think the idea that we're going to be able to get 2,500 people into a hall in November is frankly optimistic, unless, of course, a vaccine or treatment is discovered uh, between now and then. But even that, uh, looking at, at the projections from health economists and doctors uh, seems unlikely to have been done by November. So yes, this is going to have implications for us internally as well. But the DA seems committed to still going ahead and getting new leadership. It's just a question of how to go about doing it. Correct. And I think it is important. You know, I need to be able to be given a mandate to by the broader party mm. to lead the party, particularly given the fact that the local government elections are looming. But also, if I'm not successful, I think you need to give whoever is elected as the leader enough of a runway to be able to establish themselves and their brand heading into the local government elections. So, you know, I think that we are going to have to have a leadership election this year. Um, I certainly don't want to lead the party in the current circumstances uh, into another year. Um, you know, are there things I want to do? There's, um, you know, some, some stuff that needs to be done in the party, but I need to have the mandate of the, of the federal body to be able to do so. Um, and I, I think it, I think that is only fair. Uh, and so I would like us to have this leadership election concluded sooner rather than later, um, because there's lots of preparations that need to be made either way. Just a quick update on a few things. Um, what is the status on Tuani now? I know that they had gone to court. Do you know when the court outcomes are expected, the judgment? And also, what is happening? I know that Gauteng had appointed a team to carry on with administrative duties. What is the status of, of the region? Well, I, I think it's a, a less than ideal situation. Um, and I think that um, the, uh, the government in, in Gauteng have now got the worst of both worlds. I think it would have been better to have in the times of crisis a, a government in there, um, at least that they could work with. Now they've got administrators. You've got councillors there who are not... Uh, you know, are not really able to perform their functions and duties. And it's mm. hugely problematic. I mean, it's unlikely we're going to be able to move to an election in Chwane in the short term, given all the reasons that we've already discussed uh, today. Uh, and so I think it's a very untenable situation. And we're hoping the court is going to grant relief and make sure that, uh, that the, our councillors can return to work. And we can set about either getting a unity government in there for just the time of the crisis, or to, you know, tell people, you know, find a way of, of convening the council remotely and electing a leadership. But I, I think it's less than ideal that at a time of national crisis, we've got uh, the capital city of the country uh, without political leadership. And I think that's, that's problematic. So um, we're going to get an update in the next day or two from our legal team about where we sit there and with a few other legal matters that we're involved with. And uh, we'll obviously have to make a call on, on the best way forward. But of course, our primary commitment is to making sure there's effective uh, governance in Chwane, particularly in the time of crisis. And then just one more thing, really, uh, just your thoughts on this. You know, if, if about a few weeks ago, Dean McPherson, your campaign manager, tweeted something that kind of led to everyone saying, oh, but this is, you know, apartheid nostalgia, you know, speaking about how people actually like that level of authority or respect the level of authority. What were your views of that, his views particularly, and also somebody who's leading your team and one who many of us would imagine is part and parcel of what you bring to the people and you're offering to the people within the DA when you say you want a mandate. What did you make of Dean's views? Well, I think that Twitter is always a dangerous place to try and make an argument. And I, think this, that, yes. I think this argument was better made in the Daily Maverick piece that was there. And it was a response to citizens who seem to 
get, gather amusement or uh, support for the authoritarian jackboot uh, behavior of the SANDF and the SAPS and various metro police units around the country that they were inflicting on our citizens. And that, you know, this is not only unfortunate, um, but we should not be cheering this sort of thing on, that we're still a constitutional democracy, the Bill of Rights has not been suspended, um, and uh, people's rights need to be protected and defended. And it was in relation to the context that uh, at the end of that week, there had been more deaths from police brutality than had been from the virus itself. And I think that, you know, we, it's very easy for countries to slip into authoritarian behavior uh, in the time of a crisis. And that's why many analysts, uh, lawyers, uh, human rights activists, and uh, political leaders have been speaking out about the danger of the uh, permanence of the temporary. And I think people like Beki Kele and Fakili Imbolula and Lindiwe Zulu are enjoying these new wide sweeping powers that they have with no parliamentary oversight of them um, a, a little bit too much. And I think that we must remind them that this is still a constitutional democracy, that they are still accountable to a legislature. And why we've been pushing so hard for parliament to get off its hands and to wake up and start to perform its function. So I think the tweet was, uh, was perhaps uh, ill-advised in terms of that, but I think the context and thought behind it was absolutely the right one, and one that I've been absolutely adamant publicly that you know we can't have citizens' rights trampled, particularly in the midst of a virus, and particularly in the context where you have more people dying from the behavior of the state rather than uh, from the virus. I think that's, uh, that's something we should all unite around and reject. All right, and just before I let you go, John, I just wanted to get to, just your thoughts on business unusual, you know? You're a political leader in the middle of a campaign, you're leading the opposition party, you're a father, you're in a lockdown, you're conducting meetings and briefings via virtual platforms. How has the lockdown been for you? Yeah, it's been very interesting. And, you know, I don't think South Africa is going to be the same afterwards. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that people are getting used to meeting on online platforms like we are now. Um, but I was actually commenting to a colleague the other day, Chidi, that um, that I'm actually in more meetings and working longer hours <laughs> by working remotely no. than I am when I'm actually at the office. I mean, I can't wait for the office to reopen so that I can, you know, have a, you know, go back. <laughs> to I mean, I'm in most back-to-back meetings every day. So with very limited break and no chance to you know, go past the lunch room and and chat to people. It's just meetings, meetings, meetings. So, I think that our bosses uh, across the the world are going to be very excited about what this actually means for product. <laughs> but um, yeah, sort of, uh, I have, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. That was John Steenhazen, the interim leader of the DA, speaking about the smart lockdown, but also how a political party functions during a lockdown and in a time of corona. So this is yet another week where you will not have top three with Tandwa from my colleague, Lisa Gatando, who usually gives a breakdown of what we've seen in the political space and kind of preempts the way forward because we are in unusual times. It's business unusual. We're trying to find ways to navigate and to better understand how we function in a world of corona and that's it from us this week we'll chat to you again next week for news 24 my name is tiri madia and the podcast was produced by noctula magnati